Hello, JDCA. I am so sorry I can't join the call tonight, but I am spending every moment I can trying to reach out to voters, trying to do things in the cause of this election. Really, we have so much at stake. Very practically, I'm working to defend the Senate majority to help us take back the House of Representatives and to elect Kamala Harris as the next president of the United States. And so I'm so grateful for the work you all are doing to be a part of this larger cause in these final days and hours as we work together to make sure we seize this moment to advance our nation. There's so much at stake and elections like this can be so close. I've seen them a lot in my life from a election between Gore and Bush that came down to 570 votes in one state. These are narrower and narrower races, which mean our, means our activism, our engagement, our leadership mean even more. So I know this is a sobering and hurtful time even. We see the rise of demagogues and authoritarians. We see more hate speech in places we never expected we would see it. We see a lot of our fundamental rights like reproductive freedom under siege. And in spite of all that, uh, I still have hope for our nation. That hope is inspired by so many of the people I get to meet across the country who often are turning their own personal pain into a public purpose, who are joining with others, making new coalitions and new connections to say collectively that we're not gonna go back, that we know in this nation we are stronger when we realize that the ties that bind us are so much stronger than any lines that divide us. The road ahead is not gonna be easy, it never is. This country has a history fraught with challenges and obstacles and difficult setbacks, but we are also, all of us, owing a debt to people who, despite it all, still struggled and sacrificed, came together and overcame. I know that's the secret. Together, we rise. So thank you for coming together. Thank you for your commitment and your conviction. Thank you again for inspiring me to continue on. Together, we are each other's hope. We are each other's promise. We are each other's only guarantee that we can make for a better day in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. You inspire us. Good evening. My name is Susie Stern. And on behalf of the Jewish Democratic Council of America, JDCA, and the Jewish Women for Kamala, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the last call to save democracy, our final large virtual rally to get out the Jewish vote. We have just six days left before every vote in the, in the 2024 election will have been cast. Just six days to do all we can to make sure Jewish Americans and every American understands why they should vote for Kamala Harris, Tim Walls, and Democrats who share our Jewish and Democratic values up and down the ballot. We are also grateful to be officially partnering tonight uh, tonight's rally with the Harris Walls campaign who have been doing an extraordinary job engaging Jewish voters around the election. With Jewish voters outnumbering the 2020 margin of victory in Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, and more, our votes matter, our voices matter, and our work matters. Just last night, JDCA hit over 2 million direct Jewish voter contacts in this election cycle. That is 2 million phone calls, doors knocked, texts sent, and what is so critical to understand is that these are Jewish voters reaching out to other Jewish voters. These are people like all of us on this call who share the same values, Jewish values, values like democracy, individual freedom, and justice, values that we were taught at Sunday school by our grandparents, by our rabbis, by our parents, and values that Kamala Harris, Tim Walls, and Democrats across the country all share. Together, the Jewish vote can and will make a difference in this election. You can make a difference in this election. So sign up to Phone Bank, sign up to Canvas. We have six more days and let's win this thing. Thank you all for joining us and for everything that you've already done. And thank you to our incredible all-star lineup of speakers for being here. I'll now pass it over to JDCA CEO, Haley Seufer to get things started. Haley?
Thank you so much, Susie. Thanks to the campaign and to everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Haley Soifer, CEO of the Jewish Democratic Council of America, and I'm so proud of the extraordinary work that has been done by this movement, by this organization, by this campaign, and all of you to elect Kamala Harris. We stand with Kamala Harris because she stands with us. Our 1,400 volunteers this cycle have made, as Susie said, more than 2 million voter contacts so far, and our work is not done. We hope you'll join our efforts that are ongoing right through the end of this election. We're going to run through that tape in the next six days because the moment has never been more important. This will likely be the closest election in the past 60 years, but it is also unprecedented in that it presents the starkest contrast between two presidential candidates in our history. Kamala Harris is a defender of our democracy at home and abroad. And we know Donald Trump has attacked our democracy. He admires and aligns with dictators past and present, and he's pledged to be a dictator on day one. The defense of democracy is the number one issue driving Jewish voters in this election, just as it was in the past election. Kamala Harris is a longstanding ally of the Jewish community, including in the face of rising anti-Semitism. And while Donald Trump has emboldened anti-Semites and dangerous right-wing extremists, Kamala Harris has stood with us and been a part of our community as we face the scourge of hate and presented actual actions to counter it, along with the second gentleman whose leadership we are so grateful for. And on Israel, Kamala Harris has been a staunch and unwavering supporter of the U.S.-Israel relationship, which I saw firsthand as her national security advisor in the Senate. I traveled to Israel with her in 2017. We visited Iron Dome batteries, and I saw her first-hand commitment to the bilateral security relationship uh, between the United States and Israel. Since October 7th, she's repeatedly provided assurances that she will always ensure that Israel has the ability to defend itself. And she's made good on this commitment with actions, including the exponential amount of aid, more than any other year in our history that has been provided by this administration to Israel, and the fact that this White House has now twice deployed the U.S. military to defend Israel against a direct Iranian threat. Donald Trump's policy toward Israel has been best summarized by his former national security advisor, John Bolton, who's repeatedly said that Donald Trump's support of Israel is not guaranteed in a second term. There is so much at stake and Jewish voters know this and we have the ability to shape the outcome of this election. So we're grateful to all of you for being a part of our movement, for joining our efforts and those of the campaign to elect Kamala Harris, who stands for decency, truth and moral clarity as opposed to the darkness and vitriol of Donald Trump. We are going to do this together. And now I'm so thrilled to turn things over to my partner, Elon Goldenberg, who is the Jewish Outreach Director for the Harris Walls Campaign. Elon. Thank you, Haley. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to G our partners, the JCA, to Jewish Women for Kamala, to Israeli Americans for Kamala, for all the other groups. And thank you to everybody who is out there watching this for everything you have already done to elect Kamala Harris to be our next president and everything that you are going to be doing to elect Kamala Harris, our next president over the next six days. Um, you know, we have been as a Jewish outreach program now in every state, I'm off to Las Vegas tomorrow because we're not done. We're, we're going to be going to every single state which has key Jewish constituencies in it and getting out every single vote and doing more than just getting out the vote. Um, but also getting out the Jewish vote, but also getting out using the Jewish community to get out every single vote we can for Kamala Harris in every single one of these key battleground states. Um, you know, just a little bit of a reminder of why why we're why I'm supporting Kamala Harris over Donald Trump on some of the key issues. First, on Israel, as Haley said, and I know this because I was the vice president's Middle East advisor on October 7th and in the months afterwards. She had Israel's back. She has always had Israel's back. Her track record for that goes back years. Uh, and I saw it. 
Her North Star from the start was Israel was attacked on October 7th. Israel has a right to defend itself. We're going to help Israel defend itself. And she has been repeating that again and again and again throughout the campaign. It's been her position. It's been her policy. Um, it, beyond that, um, compare that to Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump, at the end of the day, you can't really rely on him for anything. He's first and foremost about himself, you know, as Haley mentioned. Uh, he, we have all of his former close national security advisors and people who work for him say you can't trust this man and you can't trust him on Israel. Days after October 7th, he was calling Hezbollah smart and criticizing the Israeli government. And this is a man who, at the end of the day, he is an isolationist who, who plays footsie with Putin. And there's a real question here about, you know, isolationism is something that's never been good for Israel. It's frankly never been good for the Jewish people. There's a long track record. And we can't think of, of um, you know, a candidate who is going to withdraw from the world everywhere else and somehow maintain this relationship and support for Israel. I'm highly, highly skeptical of it. Uh, beyond that, on anti-Semitism, Kamala Harris has led throughout her career on this issue of anti-Semitism, whether it's uh, prosecuting hate crimes as district attorney, whether it's um, the first piece of um, legislation that she worked on as a U.S. senator was an anti-Semitism revolution, uh, or whether it's been the national anti-Semitism strategy that she and her husband, Doug Imhoff, have championed the first ever national anti-Semitism strategy um, you know, uh, that, that has ever been put out by an administration. Compare that again to Donald Trump, who, I mean, where do you even begin with all the tropes? Uh, just to say, just a few weeks ago, he was at an anti-Semitism event uh, where he talked about how the Jewish people and the Jewish community would be responsible if he lost, putting a target on American Jews' backs. Like, that is Donald Trump, and we got a real clear reminder of who Donald Trump is just the other day at Madison Square Garden. Um, you know, finally... Um, I got to say, I'm very excited about Kamala Harris bringing Jewish values and traditions into the White House. We've had under her vice presidency, the first mezuzah in the vice president's residence, the first uh, um, seder at the vice president's residence, the first menorah lighting at the vice president's residence. Um, you know, and it's not just about bringing traditions, it's about bringing values, those values that reflect themselves in the support for American democracy, in the support for reproductive rights, in the support for an opportunity economy, like this is who Kamala Harris is, and the contrast with Donald Trump could not be more stark. Um, I'll just tell you one short story about um, working for her. Um, you know, I was working for her after October 7th. It was about two weeks after October 7th, uh, and we went in to brief her in preparation for her first meetings with American hostage families. Um, was, you know, you go in and you start talking to the vice president and preparing she just kind of stops us and she says, stop. This is fundamentally different than any normal meeting. I need you to go back and I need you to get every single piece of information that you have on these people. Um, I need you to get every single piece of information you have on their loved ones in Gaza because I need to go into that meeting fully prepared as deeply as I possibly can to have as real of a conversation with these families and with these people uh, as, I, as I possibly can. And I owe it to these families and I owe it to these people to be able to have that conversation with them and demonstrate to them my commitment. Um, for me, that was just a real eye opener about who she is as a leader, who she is as a person. It's demonstrated to me how she feels about Israel. She feels it in her kishkas. It demonstrated to me you know, just the empathy that she leads with. And that's who I want sitting in the Oval Office, leading our country and making the biggest decisions that this country needs to make. Um, and so, look, we have six days left. Um, and first, please go out and vote. Make a plan to vote if you haven't already. If you can vote, vote right now. Uh, second, we need you, if you live in a swing state, if you live in a battleground state, get out and knock doors. And if you don't live in a battleground state, if you live in New York or you live in New Jersey, go to Pennsylvania. If you're in California, head to Nevada or Arizona. Um, if you're in Chicago, go to Michigan or Wisconsin. There are a number of resources that the campaign is putting up, GDCA is putting up. That we're going to try to support getting as many people to go knock doors. And we will have, we've had Jewish voter events. But, but again, where I started with 
it's not just about Jewish voters reaching Jewish voters. It's about Jewish voters reaching everyone and doing everything we can wherever they are needed to win over the next this six days because this is going to be incredibly close. And so, and if you can't knock doors, join phone banks or do whatever it is you can. Go talk to your family and friends. Make sure they vote. Uh, and so, thank you. Thank you again for everything you're doing and thank you for everything you're going to be doing. And now I will hand it over, I believe, to John Levitt. Or to somebody else. Hi, Jonah. Okay, we're going to me. Great. Um, hi, folks. I'm Jonah Platt. I am an actor and an advocate and the host of the Being Jewish with Jonah Platt podcast. And for me, the the choice is simple. Um, as a Jew, a part of what I love the most about being Jewish is our value system, uh, values of tikkun olam, repairing the world, of kindness, of reaching out to the stranger, of giving back, of humility, um, all of these things that are antithetical to what Donald Trump is about and has always been about. T to me, it's, it's incongruous that one could value those things so dearly and sort of shove them all aside um, to follow that guy. On the other hand, you have Kamala Harris, who is someone who actually cares about Jewish people, not in the way that Donald Trump does, which is where he cares about Donald Trump. And if it's convenient to care about Jews in a moment, he will. And then when it's not, he won't. Kamala actually cares. She has you know, prosecuted hate crimes against Jews. Um, as Elon said, all these new firsts for Jews. I mean, Jews used to not even be allowed to go to the White House. Now we're having satyrs in the vice president's residence. Um, she was part of forming the first national plan to combat anti-Semitism well before October 7th. Um, she has always been in our corner. Um, also, as was said, I mean, this is the most this, in this year, it's the most aid money that America has ever sent to Israel. Um, and when the chips are down, we have been there. And I know that Kamala Harris is going to continue to be there for the Jewish people uh, because it's a real human thing. It's not an act. It's not for political gain. Um, it is something she cares about. She cares about people. She is a reasonable, decent, kind human being that we as a community can communicate with and work with, and uh, she will listen to us and we can really be partners in this upcoming administration. So, so for me, it's, a, it's an easy one and one that I'm excited about. I'm excited to see Kamala Harris as our next president. I'm excited to see Doug Emhoff as our first gentleman. And, and I know it's only just the beginning of, of opening new doors for Jewish people in this country um, and I'm excited to be there with all of you. Thank you so much, Jonah, and thank you to everyone who joined tonight. My name is Tiffany Harris. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I am so excited to cast my vote for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. This exciting prospect of Kamala Harris becoming president represents more than just a monumental political shift. It's deeply personal. She's multiracial and in an interfaith household, which doesn't look very different from the family I grew up in. And she embodies a very real picture of this country, and we can really see ourselves in parts of her story. I keep coming back to this one about how when she was a kid, she was walking around her neighborhood with that blue JFN Sadaka box raising money to plant trees in Israel. And I think that says so much about her and who she is today. She has empathy, she holds multiple perspectives, and she genuinely cares about us. She's aligned with the values that we hold so dear in this Jewish in our Jewish community. And I know that while there's a lot of joy and excitement around this election, there's also a lot of fear. In my community, among Jews of color, we're also really worried about racism and the hate crimes we see increasing in our communities. And as I've watched Harris throughout her career, what I see is her ability to prosecute hate crimes and to present a united front against racism and anti-Semitism. This stands in stark contrast with Trump, who makes crude jokes about us and is constantly fanning the flames of prejudice. But not everybody sees it. 
like everyone on this call, there are people in my life who say they might be choosing to skip this election and people on the fence need to hear from you. They need to hear from us. They need to hear from someone they know and trust. Personal conversations will counter the misinformation and it's our responsibility to provide every single person we can reach with accurate information about what's really happening and the stakes in this election. We are going to win one conversation at a time and it's your commitment that's gonna carry us across the finish line. So the next time we'll, we're all together, it'll be in celebration, a big celebration of a Kamala Harris victory. So thank you again for everyone on the call and I will pass it over to an incredible leader in our community, Jill Goldenberg. Thank you so much, Tiffany, but I'm actually gonna hold because John Lovett just joined and I'm gonna pass it over to him. Hi, okay, we figured it out. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you all for getting on. Um, uh, home stretch. I know everybody's nerves are uh, afraid. Everybody is uh, feeling that uh, terrible mix of hope and anxiety as we head into uh, the final few days. Everybody on the Zoom understands the stakes. Everybody knows uh, what we have to do. We just have to go out and do it. And I also think at this moment, like we've all got to we're all within two hours of either a swing house race or a, a swing state that will determine this election. We all can make calls. Uh, we all can send texts. We all can reach out to people in our lives who might be on the fence, whether it's uh, 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 about who to vote for or whether to vote for. But also, I, I also just want to say that I, I felt really inspired and reminded um, last night by Kamala Harris's speech on the ellipse about the stakes in this race. And you know, we've been a fight against Trump and Trumpism for a decade, and I think it speaks to the resolve and dedication and faith and values of millions and upon millions of Americans that despite a uh, a massive campaign to dispirit us, to moralize us, get us to give up, we're still in this fight. You know, 2016, I think a lot of us went into that election um, uh, with a kind of layer of protection that we didn't believe something terrible could happen, and then it did. Uh, we are now, I think, well past that. We all understand that we could wake up uh, having won, and we can wake up having lost, and the difference is really going to come down to us and what we do over the next uh, six days. But seeing Kamala Harris on the ellipse uh, reminded me that, um, you know, we're all doing everything we can to make sure that we go to sleep on election day, uh, knowing um, that we didn't leave anything up to chance, that we have a candidate who has risen, this, risen to this occasion and spoken honestly and truthfully about the stakes, uh, who has uh, accepted in this remarkable way a campaign uh, uh, that should have been built over years, but was built in a matter of days, taken on this mantle and risen to the occasion and exceeded, I think, the expectations of even her greatest admirers um, to be the person to carry this um, uh, this banner of uh, of freedom and, and democracy and uh, respect for one another, uh, uh, American values, but, are all, but values that are also Jewish values. And that makes me feel really hopeful. You know, I think about um, the conversations people are having in these last few days. I think about the the the, the kind of speech that Michelle Obama gave uh, about the the way in which we can speak to our loved ones about why we care so much about what happens in this race. I think about the conversations uh, I've had just in canvassing the conversations I know everyone on this call or many of us on this call have had. And that makes me hopeful because I, I think if we have those conversations, if we if we make sure people understand the stakes, we speak to the values that the vast majority of Americans have, uh, we will win. And if we do everything we can, if we do everything we're supposed to do over the next uh, few days, uh, we will win. And so I, I, I know a lot of people on this call are, are feeling uh, the anxiety. I am too, uh, but uh, we just have to do, a, a, we have to just work very hard for a few more days and go to sleep on that election night, uh, knowing that we uh, left it all out on the field. And if we do, uh, we will have Kamala Harris as president. And then we will also have a second gentleman who hides the Afi Komen. And I think that that's very exciting. And that makes me feel hope. So thanks everybody for being on here. And with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, an incredible member of Congress, uh, someone who led the fight 
against Trump, someone who has spoken so honestly and directly about the stakes in this election, someone um, who has shown, I think, so much perseverance and courage and fortitude in not just his public life, but in his um, in his values uh, and uh, in his uh, ability to overcome so much. Uh, Jamie Raskin. Uh, John Lovett, hey, thank you for those very kind words, man. And uh, what a thrill and honor it is to be with all my friends at JDCA and um, thousands of people across the country. Uh, I returned from a 27 state tour. I was uh, in Pennsylvania for my sixth and I think final time. Um, and uh, I'm seeing just this extraordinary outpouring of activism and creativity um, by people standing up for democracy and freedom against the autocrats in Moscow and the kleptocrats and plutocrats in Mar-a-Lago and the theocrats with Mega and Mike Johnson. And the Democrats are going to beat all of them. And we've got a magnificent leader in Kamala Harris who really spelled out the terms of this race yesterday, because what we've got really is two contrasting forms of government that are vying against each other all over the planet right now. Um, we believe that in democracy, government has got to be an instrument for the common good of all and the public interest. And Donald Trump, of course, believes only in Donald Trump, and he believes that government is an instrument for private self-enrichment and taking in millions and millions of dollars from uh, corrupt governments, including China and Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and Indonesia and Egypt, and you name it. Um, those are two radically contrasting forms of government. And, um, you know, my grandfather was the first Jewish person ever elected to the Minnesota state legislature uh, in the 20th century. And he was a strong progressive New Deal Democrat. He was a strong Zionist, and he wanted to see human rights and social justice and peace uh, prevail all over the world. And those are the same ideals that I'm fighting for uh, today, right now. And um, we've got to beat the tyrants and the despots and the dictators. I mean, Elon Musk, who's basically bankrolling the Trump operation right now, is in constant touch with Vladimir Putin um, and uh, other autocrats around the world. So uh, we can't be on the side of the tyrants and the pharaohs. We've got to be on the side of the people and the security of uh, people all over the world, the freedom, the human rights, and the peace of people all over the world. And um, so we're not going to be taking orders from uh, right-wing strongmen and theocrats and plutocrats anywhere. We're going to be standing for strong democracy and freedom for the women and the men of America uh, against uh, the mega movement. And uh, I'm just delighted to be working with all of you. And I encourage everybody to keep it up and don't believe the wall of propaganda and disinformation paid for by right wing money in the last week of this campaign. Remember the feeling we had when the great Joe Biden decided to pass the torch to Kamala Harris and when we went to the Democratic Convention and what I'm seeing all over the country. OK, so. Um, uh, that's the feeling that we're going to end with, not all of the fear and trepidation that they're engineering as a strategy to try to demoralize people. So please tell the young people in your lives, your brothers, your sisters, your kids, your grandkids, that everything you need to know about voting in 2024 is everything you need to know about driving in 2024. If you want to go forward, you put it in D. If you want to go backwards, you put it in R. That's all they need to understand. Please spread the word. Thank you, uh, JDCA, for all of your magnificent work. And I think I might be passing it off to my friend, Governor Polis, who's been doing such an extraordinary job out in Colorado. And I've seen your mom and dad on the road, too, I think in California, Jared. Uh, thank you, the, Jamie. The great Governor Polis. Hey, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jamie Raskin, my good friend from Congress. Uh, and yes, he just got together with my parents. They really appreciated meeting him. And as you can also see, both Jamie and I are both in cars, but neither of us are driving. So we're close to that uh, <laughs> D versus R metaphor. But don't worry, we're doing it in a safe way um, as well. And we wanted to take this occasion just to make sure that Jewish voters across America 
uh, know the importance of this election, whether it's to Jewish Americans, to Jews across the world, to the state of Israel, nothing could be more important. And I think it's very stark when you look at the way, and we know that sadly, of course, there's people that are anti-Semitic across the ideological spectrum from left to right. Um, and when it, what's really a test of character is how people deal with anti-Semitism in their own camp. And Kamala Harris is somebody who can always be counted on to denounce anti-Semitism on the left, to stand with the state of Israel, to stand against hate crimes, and to stand with Jewish Americans. Donald Trump has already failed that test on the right, fails that not only fails to stand up to anti-Semitic forces on the right, uh, remember the demonstrations in Charlottesville, Jews will not replace us, uh, but also incorporates elements uh, of the far right and neo-Nazi movement into his governing coalition. That's not anybody that should be part of any governing coalition, whether it's on the anti-Semitic left or the anti-Semitic right. And it's very important that we have leaders that are willing to stand up. It's easy to stand up to those on the other side, but to stand up to those who might be on their own camp with some issues and say, this is wrong, anti-Semitism is wrong. We want to make sure we have an America for everybody, no matter your faith, no matter your race. Uh, that's exactly what Kamala Harris will do uh, as the next president of the United States. Of course, an exceptional and historic opportunity to elect the, the first uh, gentleman of the United States, Doug Imhoff, the very first Jewish American uh, that, to, that will be reside in the White House. Historic opportunity. Uh, and of course, uh, we know to get the hostages freed, we need a stable hand in international relations. We will make sure that we continue to pressure Hamas with every leverage possible to free the hostages while they are still alive. We know that Donald Trump plays footsie with the dictators of the world, right? Uh, he takes the side of those who flatter, flatter him rather than those who are kidnapped or oppressed. Uh, and we need to make sure we have that moral guidance of leadership that Kamala Harris will provide to make sure to apply maximum pressure, yes, on Hamas, but also on Iran uh, and other uh, forces of chaos uh, and attack in the Middle East to make sure that we can protect, of course, the Jewish state of Israel, uh, as well as work towards uh, autonomy for the Palestinian people who can finally be freed from the dictatorship of Hamas. Uh, in the Gaza Strip. So please join me in not only casting your ballot for Kamala Harris, but also making sure your friends, your family, your cousins know the importance of this election. Whether they live in Pennsylvania or Georgia or the swing states or they live anywhere across the country, we want to make sure the voice of every American is heard. And I know that I can count on you to cast your ballot in time for the election for Kamala Harris. Thank you. With that, I want to turn it over to uh, not only a prominent Jewish and American member of the Senate, but the former president of her synagogue board of directors, Jackie Rosen from Nevada. Jackie. Thank you, Governor. We were served together in the House. I saw Jamie. I don't know if you're still on there, Jamie. I heard your remarks. Uh, uh, thank you for being on this and uh, for everything you do. And JDCA, uh, I want to thank you for putting everybody on this call and uh, everything you're doing to get to get people out to vote because what we're less than a week away now right and we're facing a crossroads and I don't have to reiterate although I will that this election is one of the most important ones if not the most important one certainly in my lifetime and I don't have to tell anybody on this call what the past few years has been like to be a Jewish person in the United States or around the world. Jewish families everywhere, worried about our future, worried about our country, worried about the place that we as Jewish Americans have in it. Anti-Semitic harassment, vandalism, violence on the rise since October 7th through the roof all around the world. Jewish families here worried about our country and the place, like I said, that we all have in this society. And that's why it's unconscionable. Unconscionable, I could say it a little stronger, but I'll leave it at that, that Donald Trump as Republican nominee for president has openly praised Nazi generals and said, and I quote, I need to have the kind of generals that Hitler had. Well, I, I'm gonna be diplomatic. These comments are more than offensive more than offensive. They downplay the horrors of the Holocaust. They downplay the mass murdering of Jews and so many others at a time when anti-Semitism anti is skyrocketing. 
everyone who agreed with him and stood stand there in that room and hasn't called him out on that, they're complicit as well. And so I have I would be here all day if I wanted to talk about Donald Trump and his Nazi comments, but I denounced the comments and my MAGA opponent, Sam Brown, I asked him to, well, maybe he could put a, you know, have a comment about uh, defending someone who says they need to have Nazi generals. Well, all I got is silence. He refused to call Trump out. Instead, he doubled down on his support of Trump. Doubled down, doubled down. It's shameful, it's disqualifying. And it's the only Jewish woman serving in the Senate and the first former synagogue president to serve. And yes, I am proud of that. Uh, I had a full life before I came to Congress and in my philanthropy life, I am proud. It's a blessing and honor of my life to serve my Jewish community. And I am running for reelection to continue speaking out against anti-Semitism, especially at this moment in time. You know, I got into public office because of the principles of tikkun olam and the idea that it's up to each and every one of us to do our part to repair the world, no matter what our corner is, whether it's actually a small corner, whether you can just help a friend or a neighbor, or whether you can go to the United States Congress, Senate, you've seen governors on here. It is our responsibility to leave the world a better place than how we found it. And I served with Kamala Harris in the Senate. Actually, her, her desk was next to mine and uh, we developed a good friendship. And I know that Kamala Harris understands the principles of Tikkun Olam and she is running a campaign that will lead our nation with this ideal in mind. She's leading us for a vision for the future. So believe me when I tell you, when it comes to who will best represent the Jewish people in the United States, I believe there is a clear, clear choice in this election. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've been speaking a lot, my throat's a little, uh... <laughs> anyway, as Vice President Kamala Harris, she's been committed to combating anti-Semitism. The work that she and Second Gentlemen have done to elevate this issue, um, it's been a source of strength for Jews around the United States. And when I called on this administration to develop a national strategy to combat anti-Semitism, they delivered. They delivered. And when the world needed moral clarity in the face of rising anti-Semitism, the administration, they stood strong. And when Israel was attacked on October 7th, the deadliest days for the Jews since the Holocaust, Vice President Harris and the administration rallied behind an aid package to help Israel defend itself against Hamas and she has continued to push for release of all the hostages. And I just want to add, I was proud to spend the second night of Passover voting for that aid to Israel to help save the Jewish state. And so elections, they are about choices, right? And this one, I believe, couldn't be more clear. Couldn't be more clear. Well, with just a week just less than a week actually left to go. We have to get out the vote. We have to be sure that everyone supports Kamala Harris, Democrats up and down the ballot, the work you're doing, whatever state you're in, wherever you're watching from, it's critical. And I'm so grateful. And if you happen to either be coming here to Nevada to help knock doors or you work, live in Nevada, be sure that you vote. Be sure that you tell everyone you know to go vote. It matters, it will make the difference. We can't sit on the sidelines. And uh, everything you do every single day, all the work we do together, it is critical. Um, and I look forward to hopefully returning as the uh, uh, former synagogue president and my second term as a United States Senator with everyone's help. And now I'm excited, I see her, I have a very little part of my screen, but I see her over there. I'm excited to introduce your JDCA board member, Jill uh, Goldenberg, uh, thank you all for having me, and uh, let's let's keep it rolling through election day. Thanks. Thank you so much, Senator. We are looking forward to you returning to the Senate, so that we can all benefit from your leadership. So I have a question for everyone on this on this uh, webinar. Do you have a particular moment you can identify as the time? that you actually realized that politics mattered? I do. I was 11 
sitting around our family table for a Sunday night dinner in St. Paul, Minnesota with my extended family and Auntie Phyllis led the discussion about the Supreme Court's recent Roe v. Wade decision. Now you can figure out how old I am. I will never forget when she said, no man should make a decision about what happens with my body. She was right then and she's right now. Donald Trump and his Christian nationalist friends belong nowhere in the decisions you, your daughters, or your granddaughters are making about themselves and their bodies. And make no mistake, Project 2025 states clearly, they are coming after birth control. They are coming after IVF. Among the many reasons that I am supporting Kamala Harris and working my heart out to knock doors and organize and get out there to talk to voters is to ensure that Roe v. Wade becomes the law of the land once again. All women regain control over our own bodies and women stop dying under Trump abortion bans. When I cast my vote last week for Vice President Harris, I voted for freedom. I hope you'll join me in not just voting, but also getting out there and talking to other voters about what is at stake in this election. It is now my joy to turn it over to Rabbi Sharon Brouse, who I have found to be such an inspiration over the course of these, particularly these last months, and I am sure you will too. Rabbi? Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you. Um, well, as the rabbi on the call, I want to just offer us a little piece of Torah for this last week as we approach the election. We happen to be reading this week from the beginning of the book of Genesis, the story of the Tower of Babel from Parshat Noach. And here we learn that everyone on earth was united, that everyone had the same language and shared a common purpose. And that actually sounds really good. In some ways, this is precisely what we want, especially in a time of so much disconnection and loneliness and polarization. This is community, everybody coming together and working on our problems together. But the problem was that this project, the tower, was people trying to climb to the heavens for their own purposes, for their own greatness. They thought they alone could fix it. This was about building up from the heaven, from the earth to the heavens, people striving to be God. And we happen to know that there's another way to come together in community, in shared purpose, and to build. And that is to make sure that we create together a heaven right here on earth, a future that's not built on a cruel and callous and extremist and hateful and racist and anti-Semitic and exclusionary vision of America, but instead, an America that is rooted in justice and human dignity and peace where our workers get paid fair wages and every, 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 everyone has access to medical care where women's bodily autonomy is honored and LGBTQ people are loved and dignified as images of God, where racism and poverty and climate devastation are not inevitabilities. To achieve that vision, we have to find the same unity of language and purpose toward making this country and this land a heaven on earth. Now, the first week that I was in college, I remember sitting in convocation and they did that thing where they say, look to your left and look to your right. One of you will not make it to graduation, which is a kind of cruel thing to say to 17 year olds. I just want to invite us for a moment into a version of that right now in these final days before the election. I'm inviting you to look to your political left. Those who, in previous elections, probably never would have thought of not voting for whoever the Democratic candidate was at the top of the ticket, but now frankly find themselves on the fence because they don't align with the way the administration has handled the war in Gaza. I'm asking you to turn to those people to your left and remind them that the only way that there will be a just and dignified and peaceful future for Israelis and Palestinians alike is if there is a strong, responsible U.S. administration. And I'm going to invite you to look to your right, to those who say they just have a gut feeling, they just don't trust, trust that the vice president will stand with Israel when push comes to shove. I am going to ask you to remind them 
that as Haley and Elon and so many others have already shared on this call, Vice President Harris has continued to support Israel, has consistently called for the return of the hostages, has consistently fought for Israel's democracy. Please have these folks to your right listen to the voices of the thousands of Israelis who today are pleading with American Jews to vote for the only candidate who will bring sanity and stability and ultimately peace to the region. Listen, we know that Vice President Harris is deeply empathetic to the Jewish story. She understands Jewish trauma and Jewish values and Jewish dreams because she shared, shares those dreams with us. These are her dreams too. So every single one of us has to do what we can, not only to vote, but to knock on doors, to monitor polls, to cure ballots, especially in the face of the unprecedented threat against our poll workers this year to fight for our democracy, to talk to anyone and everyone who will listen about how much this matters, how much is on the line. This is our holiest and most urgent work in this time. In the face of the grave and unprecedented threats to our democracy, to our bodies, to our earth, we are being offered by Vice President Harris a lifeline. This is a political movement that is already precedent setting. It will be transformative for our nation, for all of us to live under President Kamala Harris. So please let us come together in common purpose and do whatever we can to support her in her campaign to become President of the United States. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Hurwitz. Thank you so much. So my name is Sarah Hurwitz and I'm a former speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama. And you know, in recent months, I've been thinking a lot about my grandmother, my bubby, Kate Hurwitz. She was a single mother and she worked two jobs to support her kids. But whenever she was out driving, she would always stop to let taxis and truck drivers cut ahead of her. Driving is how they make their living, she would say. So they really need to go first. She also told us about how decades ago, her parents sent boat tickets to relatives in Europe, begging them to leave. But they kept saying, it's fine, it's fine, it'll blow over. But it wasn't and it didn't. So my bubby knew in her bones that civilization is fragile, and with the wrong leaders, everything can fall apart. And when it comes to electing those leaders, we can quibble all day about this policy or that and that thing they once said that we didn't like. But here is what I know from working for eight years in the White House, that when a president sits in the Oval Office making decisions that change history, what matters are the two things my bubby taught me. First, are they decent and kind? Do they actually know right from wrong? And equally important, do they believe in the rule of law? Do they understand that civilization is both precious and fragile? And this is why, this is why I am supporting Kamala Harris in this election, because I know that she is decent to her core. And I know that she has an unshakable commitment to our democracy. So now this is on us. As the second gentleman said earlier this week, when we study history and we see how societies can fall apart and start blaming Jews, we always think, why didn't people see this coming? Why, why didn't they do something? Well, we are now those people. We are actually going to be in someone else's history books someday. And that is why we need to do everything we can in these next few days to elect Kamala Harris as our next president. Thank you. And it is now my pleasure to introduce these videos from the extraordinary Mayim Bialik and Judy Gold. Hey everyone, it's Mayim Bialik here. Um, I just wanted to thank all of the incredible volunteers who have been making calls and knocking on doors to, um, to support Vice President Harris and Tim Walls. Uh, I was really, really honored to get to be um, part of your community, as it were, uh, when we elected President Biden and Vice President Harris um, four years ago. Um, you know, for me, this um, this election is a no-brainer. I think uh, you all probably feel the same. And um, in particular, with all the conversation about um, Israel going on and Jewish voters, um, still an absolute uh, no-brainer for me as a as a liberal as a democrat as a zionist um um huge supporter um of 
of Vice President Harris, um, of Doug Emhoff, second gentleman. And um, I just really want to um, thank you all for the very, very important role that you are playing in getting the word out there. Um, we're not there yet, so please keep it up. This is an incredibly important election. Um, I think it's probably the most significant election many of us um, have seen and will see in terms of rhetoric, in terms of what's at stake. And um, I do believe our democracy is at stake. And um, I do believe that decency is at stake. And I do believe that, especially um, for me as a, as a Jewish American, there's a lot at stake here that um, I believe very strongly in electing Vice President Harris um, to achieve um, on behalf of so many populations and so many minority populations, including um, me as a Jewish person. And um, I hope that that is something that um, people will continue to um, understand and increasingly understand. Thank you so, so much. Sign up for one more shift. We need all the help we can get. Home stretch here. Um, thank you so much for what you're doing for um, electing Vice President Harris and Tim Walls. Hey everyone, it's me, Judy Gold, and uh, I'm back. I'm back. This is the most important election of my lifetime. And I'm, I know I'm only 30, but we got a lot at stake here, people. And as a woman, as a very, very proud Jew, as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, Kamala Harris has the values that I was brought up with. Takuna Lum, Takuna Lum, healing the world. That is what Kamala and Tim want to do. You know, I mentioned last time that my grandmother, who I was very close with, would come visit every weekend and we'd share a bedroom and she was born in 1896. She was 24 when women got the right to vote, 24. That is beyond ridiculous. But you know what's even more ridiculous? That two days ago, was the 50th anniversary of a law that allowed women to be able to apply for a loan or a credit card without their husband or male relative co-signing for them. 50 years ago. That is yesterday. And they want to go back. So this is all I have to say to you. Get out and vote. Stop whining, stop complaining, stop not getting out of bed, stop worrying and worrying. Make your voices heard. We have a First Amendment. And guess how the, guess the, guess what the best way to exercise that First Amendment is? To vote. Because that's how your voice is heard. I mean, my voice is really loud, and I'm sure you can hear it as I'm recording this. But let me tell you something. Tell your friends, tell your kids, nieces, nephews, parents, that this is the only choice. Go do it. We are gonna win on Tuesday. And it's because of your support, your vote, and your voice. So get out there, babies. Let's do this. Go Kamala, go Tim, go democracy. See you on Tuesday. That was wonderful. Um, I wish I were as loud as, as Judy Gold, um, but I, I, I'm nice. And the way that I am talking to my Trump voting relatives is by very nicely explaining to them that not only, as Governor Paulus mentioned, there is an anti-Semitic right, but Donald Trump is the anti-Semitic right. So I'm going to do two things with my time as a comedy writer and an author who is dwarfed by the magnanimous speakers who came before me and will come after me. I will do two things. I will talk about how you nicely talk to the people in your life, and I'm seeing you in the chat, the people in your life who will not vote for Kamala Harris, who are Jewish, and I will talk to you about your anxiety that you're feeling right now if you're on this call. Okay, so how do we talk to our Jewish relatives nicely um, who are voting for Donald Trump? Hello, everybody. Oh. Hello. I don't mean to interrupt, but... It's Chuck Schumer, I'm supposed to go on now. Please. <laughs> okay, I'll be brief because I didn't want to interrupt, but I want to thank everybody for getting on the Zoom. To, to, um, and I thank the Jewish Democratic Council of America, Haley Sofer, Ron Klein, Susie Stern. I don't know if they're on, but thank you for the good work you do. Obviously, this is a crucial time for our country. 
And uh, aside from talking about Jewish issues, look, our whole democracy is at stake. Uh, let me just tell you something about why it's so important to keep the Senate. If God forbid Trump becomes president, what the Republicans have said if they win the Senate is they're going to have the two um, uh, oldest Supreme Court justices step down. They want to leave anyway. Uh, they are um, Alito and Thomas and replace them with two 40-year-old MAGA justices who will affect not only our lives, but our children and our grandchildren. Things like democracy, the right to choose, helping those who need help. So many issues will just be out the window if they do that. So I've been working all day on our candidates, to, and I'll tell, give you a little rundown in a few minutes in terms of keeping the Senate. But it's so vital for our country. It's vital to win Kamala, to have Kamala win, obviously. It's vital to win the House. And just look, if we win the House, keep the Senate, and Kamala's president, you saw that in 2021-22, um, in we had the greatest legislative record ever, I must say, led by the Senate. Uh, we passed the IRA. We passed the Chips and Science Bill. We passed the Infrastructure Bill. We passed the Gay Marriage Bill. We passed the... Uh, uh, Pact Act to help our veterans. First time we curbed the NRA on guns. The list goes on and on. So much so that as leader, I, we've got a, a little note from Robert K. Rowe. He wrote the book Master of the Senate about LBJ. And he wrote one of the 25 original books. He inscribed it to me and said, to the Jewish LBJ, congratulations. <laughs> so that was pretty good. And I am the highest ranking Jewish elected official ever in America. And we fight very hard for Jewish issues. And I heard our previous speaker just mention a little bit of some of our Jewish friends who want to vote Republican. They seem to have this idea that the Republicans are better for, the, uh, for Israel than the Democrats. Well, let me give you one thing that you can remind them with. So probably the most important vote we had for Israel was the aid to Israel that was part of the Supplemental Security Assistance Pact. As you know, the House held that bill up for months, but we finally got it. We, Mitt McConnell and I, and it was bipartisan, uh, brought the bill to the floor of the Senate. It had no conditions on aid to Israel. I was opposed to any conditions. As you know, I've had my criticisms of Netanyahu, but my desire to, to support Israel militarily and in every way so that it can defend itself is very strong. And so we had no conditions on the bill, you know, and even though some on the left wanted it. Do you know how many Democrats voted against that bill? Out of the 51 Democratic senators, three. Bernie Sanders did, Peter Welch did, he's from Vermont with Bernie and Jeff Merkley uh, for his own reasons. Every other Democrat supported it. Here's the astounding thing. Who voted against them? How many Republicans voted against the bill? 20, 20 voted against aid to Israel including J.D. Vance, now the nominee for vice president on the Republican side. Now, why did they vote against aid to Israel? Two reasons. One, neither of them very good. One is they're isolationist. The Republican Party has become more and more isolationist. America first, they say. They mean they don't want the United States involved in foreign policy. They don't want foreign aid. They don't want any of this. The hard right wants to cut all foreign aid, including aid to Israel. Now, if Israel is, if America abandons the field and Israel is left all alone to defend itself against Iran, that's big trouble. That's the most trouble Israel could have. The second reason they voted against it, they didn't want aid to Ukraine. Well, if voting against aid to Ukraine is more important than supporting America's great ally in the Middle East who we've supported, Israel, then what does that show about their values? Now, can you imagine if it had been a Democratic nominee for vice president who voted against aid to Israel, we would be hearing it in the New York Post and among the right wing radio and all the Republicans all the time, all the time. And so that is important. A few other things. Uh, we know anti-Semitism is dramatically on the increase. So we Democrats actually did something about it. We passed the nonprofit security grant program that was my law. As, a, as the highest ranking Jewish elected official in America, I believe fighting uh, anti-Semitism and protecting our Jewish institutions is vital. We got over $400 million 
in that bill, 455 million, and it helps provide security for our synagogues, our yeshivas, our religious schools, and other Jewish institutions that have been attacked. It can provide uh, money for hardening, you know, windows and doors and gates and cameras, but also for security guards that can patrol. And a ton of that money has gone out. And when um, COVID occurred, we made sure that Jewish institutions got their fair share of the COVID aid, uh, which was so desperately needed. So we help over and over again. Um, there is no question in my mind that the Democrats in the Senate and the House and in the White House do far more to protect Israel than the Republicans, despite their rhetoric. And we've also, one other point, folks, we've kept it a bipartisan issue. Through all the years I have been in the House and Senate and carried so much of the pro-Israel legislation, it was always bipartisan. We always asked a Republican to join us. But these new hard right Republicans want to make it a partisan issue. That is, if you lose half of America, whether it's the half that are Democrats or the half that are younger or whatever, that is damaging to Israel. And Republicans do that every day. So we have many, many reasons to make sure that we win the presidency, uh, keep the Senate, win the House. What are the chances? I think they're darn good. You know, the polls show things are neck and neck. But one of the secret weapons I think that we Democrats have is a much better ground game, which is working right now in the battleground states in the, in the Senate and certainly in the presidency. And that may be good for a couple of points on election day. Uh, the early vote returns are showing that lots of Democrats who didn't vote in 2022 are mobilized. And I will tell you this, of our eight battleground states, we are ahead or neck and neck in every one of them. Even Tester has gained in the last week as they discovered his opponent lied about his service in Iraq. He said he, he has a bullet in his arm. He's a veteran. I respect that. He said, well, I got it defending my troops in Iraq. It so happens it was discovered last week that he got it for playing with his gun while hiking in a national park. And Tester has on TV right now ads from one of the fellow SEALs who served with uh, this she, he, the Republican candidate, and said he did not uh, get the wound in Iraq. And then we have the park ranger who was there when she, he actually shot himself on TV saying, no, he shot himself here. So even testers in good shape, we have decent chances of picking up three seats. We're even in Texas. We're a point or two behind in Nebraska. We're only three points behind in Florida. So we have, we're right on the edge of keeping the Senate of winning the House, of keeping the presidency. And as I said, for the sake of Israel, for the sake of fighting anti-Semitism, and for the sake of getting government to do the right thing for people, for all the kinds of issues that tikkun olam and tzedakah teaches us, it's important to elect Democrats. So go all out. This is it, folks. We're right on the edge. We need your help. Thank you for your support. Hello, you know, I'm a comedy writer. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh, I have. I will say this, that is Leader on. Schumer. Leader Schumer, I was your intern in 2007 in your New York office. So um, it really uh, does uh, put me exactly in the place where I have always belonged. And I will you. also say, um, and it made me want to be a speechwriter. And I've since gone out and written for President Biden and um, Secretary Clinton. And, um, and we and have a lot of people DNC. who are on our stamps, interns or otherwise, who've gone on to bigger and better things. So I'm very uh, proud of all of you. Good work, Bess. Thank you. Thank you, Leader Schumer. It is an honor. And I will say this has now gone from a webinar to a Seder. Feel free to just start talking whenever anybody. Um, mm -hmm. Now now it's now it's family. No um, so, so here we are. And okay. I'll let you get back to saving democracy as we know it. Thank, Thank you so you. much for the actual work that you do on behalf of a grateful nation. So here we are. My spiel, I'll, I'll make quick. We've heard, all, we've heard, thankfully, a lot of aligned messages tonight. We all do know, hopefully, if we are on this call, that Donald Trump is an anti-Semite. And I have just a few bullet points, if you are taking notes, that might be useful. I'll zip through those. They're very depressing, but I'll say them with a, a nice smile. Um, also, Schumer and I, Senator Schumer and I, we go to the same shul. My son is in preschool at that temple. It's, it's, it's all fine. It's all family here. So here, so Governor Polis mentioned there is an anti-Semitic right. That is the person who is on the t uh, on the ticket for Republican um, nominee for president of the United States. 
Donald, only one candidate has swastikas at their rallies. If you have a relative who is voting for Donald Trump, you tell him to look for the armbands. And only one candidate called the people with swastikas at rallies and at protests and at insurrections, very fine people and patriots. Only one candidate has praised Hitler, as Senator Rosen said, but he also said that should he win, this country will be a unified Reich. If that doesn't send a chill down your uncle's spine, I, I don't know what will. And then most damningly to me in 2021, he has said and has since repeated, evangelicals love Israel more than Jews in this country. And he has not met my grandma Judy, who was on this on this Zoom, um, if he believes that. Um, you know, this is what he's saying to the press. This is what he is saying in public. We can only imagine what he is saying behind closed doors at Mar-a-Lago, a place that is very important to me culturally as a Jew. My beloved grandmother, Bobby, um, who is the source material for my book, whose golf locker I have on my desk right here, who's with me right now. Um, she retired um, nearby to retirement community in Palm Beach, Florida, and would drive with me as an impressionable young child past Mar-a-Lago. And Donald Trump in Mar-a-Lago to this day at the old Marjorie Merriweather Post Estate has the largest American flag you've ever seen. And my grandma Bobby looked at me and she said, he doesn't love it because it's America. He, love it, he loves it because it's the biggest. And that is the candidate. This is not, this is somebody who will wave the flag, but only as a symbol that is a projection of his own vanity. And so that is, how, you know, it wouldn't be a Jewish Zoom if, if three panels didn't mention their bubbies. So there's that anecdote for you. And I will say this. If we are on the Zoom right now, if we are sort of clutching our laptops and, and hoping for some hope, um, it is because we are anxious. And as a Jewish mother of two young boys who I hope grow up in a country where the commander in chief is not a bully and a name caller and a convicted sexual predator, if that man is not elected president, it will be because of the anxiety that fuels the people on this call. We can use our Jewish anxiety, um, which causes all manner of stomach problems, but can also save democracy. Because of that anxiety, I am going to Philadelphia with my five-year-old this weekend to canvas. It is trick-or-treating, but the prize isn't candy. It's a stable republic. Um, I am doing that because of anxiety and unintentionally I wielded enormous guilt, another Jewish virtue on my little brother who was wondering if this weekend he could come see his nephews. I said, no, it's because you're, I, we're canvassing and he said, fine, I'll canvass too. This is the type of conversation we should all be having, making a plan to canvass. As Lovett said, we are all two hours away from a swing state, making a plan to canvass. Somebody said, how do we canvass? How, how do we canvass? The way I did it, I'm just a mom, I Googled, how do I canvas for Kamala Harris? And what popped up, I literally Googled that. And what came up was go.harris.gov. There is a website that you can plug in your zip code and you can find phone banking opportunities. Not everybody can. Oh, somebody says stop by our campaign office in Philly. I will be stopping by if you wanna join me. Um, I, we're all family here. If you want to join me, all 710 people, I will be going to the Roxborough office in Philadelphia this weekend. Shifts are at 9, noon, and 3. When you are able to say, I'm going to this office in this swing state, and I know the shifts are at these hours, it's 90 minutes of your time plus a 30-minute mom-proof training. There is no social anxiety needed at this stage in the game. This call is called Last Call. This is really the only call. This is when people are eligible to vote and turning out to vote. It is not too late. This is when it matters. You can find out when opportunities are available in your nearest swing district. Um, and you go and you talk to friendly democratic voters at this stage in the game. You are not here to change anybody's mind. You are here to do something more essential, which is help people come up with a plan to vote. That's all it is. You are knocking on doors and saying, hey, you have a mail-in ballot. Do you need to know where to drop it off? You have a polling place near you. Do you need help arranging transportation to get there? So it is just being the nudgy Jewish mother that you've always been for the good. Your anxiety can be the fuel that we need to save this country for the sake of not just my little boys who I will go put to bed in a minute, but for the sake of a generation of little boys and little girls 
who will be grateful that you were able to do something. So thank you to the JDC. Thank you for the senators, rabbis, and governors who have had me. And now it is my, uh, my privilege to introduce a very, very inspiring group of people. Um, the JDCA campus fellows, Eliza Benkier, Eva Bard, and the JDCA Youth Voter Engagement Manager, Sydney Tepper, who are doing the work in blue states with the young people who need to hear it. So I'll hand it over to them. I actually think we're going to go right over to Representative Wasserman Schultz, um, who's joining us. So Representative Wasserman Schultz, thank you so much for being a part of today's call. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for uh, for throwing us in. I um, am actually about to switch over in a few minutes to the uh, Jews for Florida Jews for Harris meeting and have to do the same thing. So I'm really thrilled to be able to join you. And uh, best thank you as a Jewish mother. We appreciate your your uh, commitment. Um, I want to just give you a snapshot into what I'm seeing on the ground here in Florida. Uh, I just came from a polling place in my district here in South Florida. And what I'm seeing on the ground after our first week of early voting is that after a really slow start, unfortunately, here in Florida, now Democrats have really picked up the pace here at home. From a Jewish perspective, I'm confident that the Jewish vote in Florida will continue to be extremely strong for Democrats. I see tremendous support for Kamala Harris in our community. You know, there's some exceptions with the ultra orthodox uh, and more, uh, you know, I would say conservative leaning Jews on Israel, uh, but that's a very small minority. One unforeseen uh, motivator for this increased enthusiasm really was Trump's racist summit that he had the other night at, at Madison Square Garden. Florida has one of the largest Puerto Rican populations in the country, and over 270,000 Puerto Ricans had not voted as of two days ago here in Florida. This could be a critical turning point for our state, especially for Debbie McCarcel Powell, who's polling very competitively with Rick Scott. Scott, as you all know, is a Medicare fraudster who wants to sunset Medicare and Social Security and backs Florida's extreme six-week abortion ban. This week, he appeared on the extremist Laura Loomer's podcast, but he's refused to debate Debbie McCarcel Powell, his opponent. He is a coward, like Trump, who ducks debates and hides out with friendly media and audiences. You know Scott will join Trump and Mike Johnson in any scheme to subvert a peaceful transfer of power, and they will certainly join in any national abortion ban effort. On that front, one of the biggest democracy threats comes from our governor here, Ron DeSantis, who is illegally pouring millions of taxpayer dollars into the so-called public health ads to defeat our abortion rights amendment. And he threatens criminal or civil penalties to his TV stations running ads in favor of it. Thankfully, they're ignoring him and running them anyway. He just doubled down saying he wants to make it easier to stew doctors who now fear arrest in our state if they improperly handle emergency pregnancies. When we talk about threats to democracy, DeSantis is executing a Vladimir Putin playbook this election. So we've really got a window for the whole country into what Project 2025 is like when it's implemented, because that's what's going on here in our state. Kamala is polling just outside the margin of error here, so we have to ensure that our base of Democrats turns out. Trump touts Maduro in Venezuela. His supporters call Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage and he still peddles that Haitians are eating cats and dogs. These three constituencies who have huge numbers in my district are motivated to vote Democratic regardless of their party affiliation. And one more race I'll highlight that I direct everyone to pay some attention to. It's our sleeper race here. I'll highlight Whitney Fox in Florida 13. That is the seat that Charlie Crist previously held. It's an extremely competitive race with Anna Paulina Luna. Whitney is remarkable and impressive, and the Luna tick is far too extreme for this independent and moderate district. So we see very promising trends in restoring democracy in Florida. Ads for DMP are running strong. Whitney Fox in Pinellas County is doing really well. And I'm confident that because of recent circumstances, Florida will overperform. So now I'd like to turn it over to my dear friend, and I mean that sincerely, not in the political way, Kathy Manning from the great state of North Carolina, who is 
before she came to Congress, was the first woman to lead JFNA and who has been an incredible partner when it comes to making sure that we can maintain and and lift up the U.S.-Israel relationship and fight anti-Semitism. I'm so proud to introduce her and to call her my friend. Kathy? Thank you so much, Debbie. And uh, I would not have made it through these four years in Congress without <laughs> you, Debbie, uh, sitting and discussing all these critical issues. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you and with everybody else. And for those of you who don't know me, I have been working on behalf of the Jewish community to combat anti-Semitism, to support Israel for my entire adult life. As, as Debbie said, as the chair of the Jewish Federation, first woman to chair the board of the Jewish Federations of North America and the board of the Jewish Agency for Israel on the board of the JDC is the founding board chair of PRISMA, the Center for Jewish Day Schools. And in Congress is the vice ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee as the lead co-chair of the House Bipartisan Task Force to combat anti-Semitism, and also on the Education and Workforce Committee, which has been quite a place to be during the rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses. So I tell you this because I want you to understand, it's not just that I understand these issues, I would never support a candidate who I didn't believe would stand with us on these issues because it would betray my life's work. So let me assure you, I am working in North Carolina and around this country to make sure we elect Kamala Harris president and Tim Walls vice president, because I believe Kamala is the only candidate for president who sees us, who understands us, and who will be with us through thick and thin as we confront some really dangerous times. I have worked with Kamala Harris. I understand, I, I've seen and I've heard that she understands that the American Jewish community has been deeply traumatized by the horrific Hamas October, uh, October 7th attack. Uh, and she has been appalled by the rise of anti-Semitism. It was on the rise before October 7th, but it has exploded uh, since then. And she has not only stood with Israel in words and actions, she has participated in some of the most significant governmental efforts to combat anti-Semitism and to support Israel of any administration. As Vice President, Kamala Harris played a key role in drafting the first ever national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. This strategy has 100 uh, action steps and accountability timelines. And the strategy, it's important, it's comprehensive, it's already having an impact. Thanks to her leadership, the Department of Education has stepped up their efforts to investigate claims of discrimination against Jewish students, and they're actually resolving more claims and holding colleges accountable for their failure to keep Jewish students safe. And they recently issued new guidelines for colleges to follow to counter anti-Semitism. And let me tell you, this issue is critically important. It's important in North Carolina and in campuses around the country. Uh, we've recently seen new protests I actually called the chancellor of UNC to hold up those new Biden-Harris regulations to make sure he has read them and he's doing everything he can to keep Jewish students safe. And he understands that if he doesn't, the Department of Education will hold him accountable. We also know the Vice, President, Vice President Harris has not only said she will stand with Israel, but she's done more than talk. As, as um, Leader Schumer, alluded to, she played a critical role in passing the National Security couple, Supplemental Package, which provided Israel with $4.3 billion in supplemental aid. She personally made phone calls to members of Congress to make sure they would vote for that supplemental aid. By the way, J.D. Vance voted against that supplemental funding twice. Kamala Harris has not only met with hostage families, she convened the first ever White House meeting on conflict-related sexual violence to shine a light on Hamas's horrific use of rape and sexual mutilation against Israelis on October 7th. And she did that at a time when other groups, progressive groups we have stood with, were actually silent on that issue. Let's not forget the Biden-Harris administration did something no U.S. administration has ever done before. In April, they moved our carrier strike group to the Eastern Mediterranean. They helped intercept Iranian missiles, drones, and rockets. They did it again after the most recent Iran strike. And they moved a 
THAAD battery, which is a terminal high altitude defense battery, to Israel, along with 100 U.S. military members to help operate that THAAD battery. In other words, they put our own U.S. troops in harm's way to defend Israel. No other administration has ever done that. I am confident that Kamala will continue to be a strong, thoughtful, reliable defender of Israel at a time when we need a president who is thoughtful and strategic. In fact, I think she's the only candidate we Jews can distrust in the Oval Office. Let's not forget that while Kamala Harris has been fighting anti-Semitism, Donald Trump has actually been fostering and spreading anti-Semitism. Now, you all know that he dined with anti-Semites. You know he's called neo-Nazis good people. But he actually spread anti-Semitism at a recent event that was called to combat anti-Semitism. He actually said that all Jews should vote for him because of what he's done for Israel, propagating the notion that Jews' loyalty to Israel is stronger than their loyalty to our country. This is a dual loyalty trope that's been used against Jews against Jews for centuries. It's always harmful. He also said if he loses, it will be the fault of the Jews. This statement, of course, draws on the age-old trope that Jews who make up only 2% of the U.S. population actually control the levers of power. And not only that, he literally put a target on our backs if he does lose the election. He essentially told his old friends, the Proud Boys, who to come after if he loses this election. Donald Trump's support of Israel is unreliable. His support of Jews is unreliable. And I just have to build on the Seder analogy that Bess Kalb so aptly used. Donald Trump is all horseradish and no gefilte fish. He's all bitter and nothing sweet. He's no sustenance, just garnish, or should I say garnished, or as my great grandmother would have said, garnished mit gormished. Lastly, something that I have to add, Donald Trump, Trump is an agent of chaos. He abhors our NATO allies, he doesn't support Ukraine in its fight against the autocrat Putin, and he would once again cozy up to our enemies and defend our allies. That can never be good for Israel or Jews in the long run. We never fare well under autocrats or dictators. Is the danger he poses real? Just ask Dick Cheney, the Darth Vader of the Republican world, why he is voting for Kamala Harris. Ask all the generals who worked for Donald Trump why they're voting for Kamala Harris. The danger Trump poses to the democracy is real and it's terrifying. Let me close by saying I'm with Kamala because Kamala is with us on all of the issues that are critical to us, not just fighting anti-Semitism, not just her support of Israel, but her support of reproductive freedom, her support of education, her support of voting rights, her support of reasonable gun regulations, her goal to make sure everyone has the opportunity to achieve the economic security they need to support themselves and their families. Her support of democracy and the peaceful transfer of power. Let's not forget that both Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have refused to say they will not, they have refused to say that they would accept the results of the election. I know all too well what happened the last time Donald Trump chose not to accept the election results because I was caught in the House gallery during the insurrection let me tell you, we don't want to see the sequel to that horror movie. Let me add uh, in closing that uh, the enthusiasm for the Harris Walls campaign in North Carolina is incredible. I just returned from two canvas, canvas launches with Governor Walls, who was remarkable uh, with students, with people who had gathered and were standing outside. The rooms were not big enough to pack everybody in uh, to hear him. And, and I can tell you that we have already surpassed our goal in North Carolina of knocking on more than 4 million do uh, doors. We know this election is about turnout. We're doing our part in North Carolina. We know everybody on this call will do their part. We only have 150 hours to go. So let's do what it takes to get our voters out and elect Kamala Harris, President of the United States. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jill Zippin and I am from Pennsylvania and I have a lot of good news to report from Pennsylvania. 
in-person early mail-in voting ended yesterday and the lines were out the door at county offices all over the state. There was a line that wrapped around City Hall and that is a big deal and really good news. We have had two large rallies in the past five days, one with Mayor Sherelle Parker that had over a thousand people and an even larger one on the campus of Temple University with John Legend, Bruce Springsteen, and President Obama. It was an extremely energized crowd. Pennsylvania is energized and getting out the vote. Second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, gave moving remarks in Pittsburgh Monday regarding the victims of the Tree of Life Synagogue, and he was well received by all in attendance and were appreciative of his remarks. PA seems to be Hollywood East now, with a steady stream of celebrities from Broadway stars to movie stars. Come door knock here and you might run into one. Speaking of door knocks, last week in Bucks County, 150 people from the Jewish community showed up to door knock and there will be door knocks every day from now to the election across the state of Pennsylvania, go to JDCA and you can find all of them and join us because we need you door knocking because we need to bring home the Keystone State. Um, I had the honor and distinct privilege to meet with Vice President um, Kamala Harris in a small group setting of Jewish leaders in Philadelphia, and I wish I could have recorded it um, and shared it everywhere, but I do want to share a few of the highlights with you, and please feel free to share what I tell you now. So one of the things she said when she began our conversation, she said, when a Black woman gives birth, she looks at that baby and wonders if they will ever really be safe in this world. And then she said she knows Jewish mothers feel the same way with respect to anti-Semitism and their children. She said her mother taught her two important things. One was how to cook, and we know she's a great cook, and the other was to care about people who were different than she was. She spoke about going out with the blue sadaka box as a child. She also said, I will never ask you to vote for me because my husband is Jewish. I ask that you vote for me because I care about the Jewish community, the Jewish people, and the safety and security of Israel. She also said, and this is going to make you all feel really good if you're anxious and upset and worried like we all are. She said, I want you to know we will win PA in this election, and I never, ever make a promise I cannot keep. She said, I promise you, we will win. So thank you. And I'm sorry, I have to run. Dan Goldman's about to be at my front door. <laughs> um, so I am going to turn it over to Julie Zebrak, Deborah Stein, and um, Adam Rosen. Thank actually, you so much. Actually, actually, we are going to go to Brian Tyler Cohn and Simon Rosenberg. So um, I'm thrilled to welcome Simon and Brian. Over to you. Hey, Bobby, thank you. Where's Brian? Is he coming in? <laughs> He's coming in. Um, listen, th everybody, this has been an amazing event. It's been great to be with all of you over these last two years. I've spoken at many of your events. It's been a great partnership. And the key here is we just got to end strong and leave it all in the playing field. I mean, polling, we are slightly ahead in the national polls. We're closer to, to 270 in the battleground states. The early vote is coming in, as Chuck Schumer said, um, on track. You know, we're doing well in the early vote. We just have to close strong in these final days and go win this thing. I mean, the way I talk about it is that we're winning this election, but we haven't won it yet. And we need to go win it in these next in these last six days. So let's work really hard, everyone. I'm sorry that I'm not here with Brian, Bobby, but thank you. And um, listen, I will also say, as you've heard from people who've been reporting in on the ground, I talked to people in all the battleground states, people in the states feel really good. <laughs> there's incredible energy, incredible optimism. People feel that there's more people doing work on the ground in all of these places than ever before. The difference between talking to somebody who's in a battleground state and somebody who isn't, who's nervous from outside is extraordinary. And so just take it as somebody who's been doing this a long time, our campaign feels like a winning campaign. 
the other campaign, as you saw the other night, and you saw this unbelievable continued struggle of Donald Trump just to put, you know, tie his shoes on every day, um, you know, is the contrast is extraordinary. And now what we all need to do is just to close strong and to take that energy that we all saw. I was lucky enough to be at the event in D.C. last night to take that energy and intensity that we all saw together and bring that to uh, to the voters that need to hear from us in this fight in these final few days. I feel good, but I'm going to feel a lot better on Tuesday night. Bobby, thank you so much. It's been so great to work with all of you for the last two years. Take care. Thank you so much, um, Simon. It's great to have you here. And now I am pleased to invite and welcome um, JDCA's Youth Voter Engagement Manager, Sydney Tepper, and two of our amazing JDCA Campus Organizing Fellows. Sydney, over to you. Thank you so much, Bobby. Um, thank you all so much for being here and getting excited for our final days before we elect Kamala Harris as our next president. Uh, so my position at the uh, Jewish Democratic Council of America is our youth voter engagement manager. So for the past couple of months, me and 46 amazing young people across the country in high schools, colleges, and young professionals have been doing the groundwork, training to be organizers, running phone banks, running text banks, getting all of our friends together to make sure that we elect Kamala Harris as our next president of the United States. And I'm so happy to say that we have made close to 1 million direct voter contacts, just our small ragtag group of people. And I am so, so happy that our fellow are on the ground on college campuses in high schools really making a difference. Um, I do want to turn it over to uh, our amazing fellow Eliza. Eliza, what is one thing that you really learned that you think you can uh, use outside of this process? Um, hi everyone. Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, one thing I've learned is to be confident and have courage when I'm standing up for what I believe in. Um, especially as a 21 year old, it can be kind of intimidating to kind of be the one um, pestering your friends about politics months in advance and things like that. Um, but I found that with the right energy and a positive attitude, um, standing up for what you believe in even relentlessly is the most important thing that you have to offer. So it's been really just a joy and a pleasure um, working for JDCA. Amazing. And Eva, what do you have a, a fun story, whether it's talking to a volunteer or talking to someone on uh, University of Michigan's campus that you want to share? Yes. Thank you, Sydney. Um, my name is Eva. Thank you for having me, everyone. Um, I would love to share a story from our my very first phone bank with JDCA back in August. Lucky me, my first caller was an undecided voter leaning towards Trump. And before I knew it, we were passionately engrossed in a 30 minute conversation about the meaning of being an, the meaning of being an American Jew in today's climate. We listened, like really listened to each other and respectfully challenged each other's perspectives. And by the end of the conversation, this voter pledged his support for Vice President Harris. And this moment really stuck with me. It became my why for why I'm doing the work. Um, and in these last six days, I know all of the fellows ask you to spark conversation, join us to Canvas, to phone bank, to text bank, or just talk to those around yeah. you because we really want to elect a president who shares these same Jewish values um, of healthy debate and meaningful dialogue like we do. Thank you both so much for really getting in there and doing the work and making sure that our youth presence is known in the ballot boxes. I'm very happy to pass it now over to our director of out, uh, our committee chair for our outreach committee, Deborah Stein, who is doing the work on the ground in Arizona. Deborah? Thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Stein from Arizona. And I just want to refresh everybody's memory that Arizona won by the least amount of votes of any state in 2020 and Jewish volunteers have been showing up to make sure that Kamala Harris wins Arizona in this election. We've held a total of 34 phone banks to speak to Arizona voters on two fronts here in Arizona, through JDCA's outreach team on what is known as the IE side and through JD, JDCA's coordinated efforts where we work directly with the Harris campaign in our efforts to talk to voters 
about the stakes in the election and to vote for Kamala Harris, Ruben Gallego, and Arizona Democrats. We've partnered with the statewide coordinated campaign for a total of 22 of those phone banks with several targeted into the congressional districts for Kirsten Engel and Dr. Amish Shaw, along with the 12 on our JDCA IEE side. And our volunteers have made over 326 attempts to reach Arizona voters during 628 combined volunteer shifts. Now, as of today, Ruben Gallego has a slight edge over Carrie Lake in the Senate race, and Ingle and Shaw's races could flip two House seats from uh, red to blue, while the presidential race is still neck to neck, neck and neck. As in 2020, Kamala Harris will win in Arizona if we continue our efforts and make more calls and knock on more doors. Jewish voters can help make sure we don't leave any votes on the table. And if we all take the call to action to make uh, more calls and knock on more doors, Jewish voters can make sure we elect Kamala Harris, Ruben Gallego, and Arizona Democrats, and we win again in this election. Thank you. We're now pleased to turn things over to JDCA board chair and former Florida Congressman Ron Klein. Ron, over to you. Thank you, Bobby. It's uh, great to great to see everybody, and uh, and thank you all, uh, Deborah, and of course our fellows, and everybody who spoke prior to this moment here. This is the moment, folks. You've heard it from everybody, and I'm sorry as we're getting to the end of the program here. I'm just going to restate the obvious. It's all about turnout. This is not a big persuasion activity at this point, it's turnout. Yes, there may be some people that have some questions and yes, you already are armed with all the necessary information to make the case as to why to vote for Kamala and Tim Walls. And by the way, Tim Walls is someone I was elected to Congress with. He's, he's everything you see on TV. He is a wonderful person, compassionate human being, totally supportive of our community, both in Israel and our Jewish community. This is our moment to do what we need to do. Our piece of the equation is the Jewish community. We're part of the Democratic coalition that will get Democrats, independents, and some Republicans out to vote for Kamala and Tim. That is our job. And whether you are in a swing state, whether you're in a state where there is a competitive Senate race or House race, we need to do everything we can. Go through your Rolodexes, go through your contact lists, send emails, pick up the phone, call your friends, your family, people you work with in other cities or in your own city where the vote matters and make sure they understand that their vote, every single vote is essential. So with that, uh, we're going to take, uh, we're going to get to the end of our program here and I have the privilege of introducing Esther Sperber and Ofer Gudelson who are the leaders of Israel Americans for Kamala. Thank you. There you guys go, you're on. Thank you, go ahead. Hi everyone, thank you Ron uh, for having us. Uh, my name is Ophir Gutelson, um, the founder of Unacceptable. I have devoted the last two years of my life to saving Israeli democracy. And two months ago, I realized that the most important things for my native home of Israel and for my adopted home of the United States is to do everything that I can to make sure that American democracy survived this election and co-founded Israeli Americans for Kamala. So many of people who are working around the clock for this campaign feel that the stakes are deeply personal. Their reproductive health and freedom is at stake the freedom of their families to stay in this country, laws and programs, they depend on their health, for their health. For me, it's personal too. My friends and family have endured a ter terrifying year of war. And throughout it, Kamala Harris alongside President Biden has steadfastly protected Israel's security and advocated for the most important things to me, the safe return of as many hostages as possible and ending the war. If as Trump and Vance advocate, the United States steps back from existential conflict with Iran, or if it pushes Israel to end the war without a clear plan going forward, my family and my country will be at risk. For me, it's therefore essential that Donald Trump is defeated and Vice President Kamala Harris elected. 
two radically different rallies held over the weekend, one full of hope and the other filled with hate, confirmed my views that the second Trump presidency is a risk that Israel cannot afford. Whereas Kamala Harris will maintain the long tradition of remarkable American-Israeli partnership, it's good to be here today and let's do everything to bring this victory on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, That's Ophir. Uh, I'm Esther Sperber, um, also working with Ophir and the group for, of Israeli Americans for Kamala, and also very involved with um, the Hostages Family Forum um, in the US. Um, I think we all know that Kamala Harris is a better person. She's smart, she's honest, she didn't rape anyone, she doesn't have fake charities. Um, but even my family, both here in the States and in Israel, um, some are considering kind of holding their nose and voting for Trump because it's better for Israel. Um, I was born and raised in Jerusalem, the oldest of 10 siblings in a um, liberal Orthodox family. And I know deep down in my heart that there is no doubt that Kamala Harris is going to be a better president for Israel, the Jews, and the world. I think we've heard almost everything I was going to say. Um, the steadfast support of the Biden-Harris administration, um, their ability to do um, to work diplomatically with other countries, um, which was um, put to uh, put in action when they led the coalition with France and the Saudis and Jordan and Jordan um, to destroy the um, Iranian-launched missile attack. Can you imagine Trump leading any kind of international coalition? I don't think he knows what that even means. And then, of course, the, the anti-Semitism. Um, last Sunday marked six years since 11 Jews were killed in the Tree of Life synagogue by white supremacists. Um, we're all shocked by the rise of anti-Semitism on both sides. But while Kamala Harris and Doug Emhoff are fighting anti-Semitism, Trump and Vance are having lunch in Mar-a-Lago with Holocaust deniers. Um, so my charge here is um, for all of us in these last few days, um, speak along with all the groundwork that everyone here has been doing, the amazing volunteering and door, door knocking. We want to offer um, our little piece of this. So Israeli Americans for Kamala have put together on our all our social media um, platforms, lots of videos and op-eds that you can use to share with friends and families who have this concern about um, Israel and the Jewish people and Kamala. And that can help all of us share um, how excited we are to go out and vote for Kamala Harris for president. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Ophir. And it's now my uh, pleasure to invite a final word from author and political commentator, Brian Tyler Cohn. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Bobby. And thank you, everybody, for being here. I very much appreciate it. Um, look, everybody has given, I think, all of exactly the right messages. So I think I will end with this one a little bit from the political perspective and the polling perspective, insofar as I can alleviate some of the anxiety around the polls. I know that um, it, tall order for, to, tell, uh, to tell a bunch of Jews that, uh, that I'm going to try to alleviate some anxiety here, but insofar as that's even possible. Um, basically, at this point, we know that the polls are tied. It is a toss-up. It is anyone's game here. There's a few things that we can look at, a few nuggets to make us feel a little bit better, and that is that a lot of the returns that we're seeing are, for example, you know, even even if they're split down the middle 50-50 or if Donald Trump is winning 51-49, remember that when we look at Republican ballots that are being returned, there are a good faction of these Republican ballots where we know Nikki Haley voters, for example, are already going to cast their ballots um, for, for Kamala Harris. We also... Um, we, we can also glean a lot of the information from undecided voters. The latest New York Times Siena poll shows that um, those voters, those independents are breaking for Kamala Harris over Donald Trump by a 10 point margin, 42 to 32. So there is some good information that we can glean. But more importantly, I think the overall message here that we should take is that we move forward every single day as if it's a completely tied race, as if we're down one or two points. and and. And what that should really tell us here is that it's on us to use some of our agency here moving forward. I think the most important thing that we can do is find one or two or three people in our circles and make them your responsibility as we head toward election day. 
I can do what I do on a daily basis and scream till I'm blue in the face. I know we can send mailers and watch commercials and put up influencers and listen to newscasts. All of those people are still not going to be as persuasive as we are in our individual circles of people. So that is a lot of power that we have. And so my, my, my best advice here is to use that power. Find people in your families who have not voted before, who are apathetic to politics, who might have just aged into the process. Maybe they're 18, 19, 20 years old. Maybe somebody voted for Donald Trump before and has soured on him since. We all have the opportunity right here to, to, to put that agency on, on full display. And, um, you know, I think what's important too, especially in light of something that, that, that did upset me, um, and that was that there are now a few news outlets that have, have decided not to endorse. And that includes the Washington Post, the LA Times, and USA Today. And at first, I was, was, was really upset about that. But at this point, I think that it's actually, it's actually more, more powerful to know that really it's not going to be on the news outlets to save us. It's not going to be on the courts to save us. The Supreme Court is a testament to that. It's not going to be on prosecutors or the attorney general or anybody else to save us here. And this this responsibility falls directly onto us. And I think that once we kind of come to terms with the fact that we really have all the power here, um, it, it makes our our responsibility perfectly clear. And so again, that is to use our agency, to use the voice that we have to, to find the people within our circles and, uh, and, and do what we can to, to make sure that we persuade them. And that's, of course, in addition to what, using this time to reach out to people, phone banking, text banking, canvassing, door knocking, whatever we can do. The last thing we want to do is look, look back two weeks from today and wish that we had done more. But right now we have the, the immense privilege of having this opportunity right here in front of us to be able to kind of elicit some type of change in the moment that we still can and uh, knowing full well that it's going to have a big impact. Like I said, we are, we are for all intents and purposes tied in seven battleground states. That, that's a huge opportunity to know that we can make a big change here. Um, a story that I tell pretty often when I'm, when I'm doing my videos on my YouTube channel is that the, the difference between a Biden win and a Trump win in 2020 was two votes per precinct in the tipping point state of Wisconsin. That's all it took was two votes per precinct. Had Trump gotten been able to flip two more people per precinct, he could have won the tipping point state. So look, we, we have the ability to flip a precinct, which can flip a state, which can flip an election. Um, and these opportunities don't come around often where, we, where, where what we do right now can impact the, the planet, our democracy, our future, and, uh, and this election right here in front of us. So um, thank you again for everybody being here. I mean, this is, I, I, this is what, you know, pe people doing these type of events and staying engaged, staying involved, is exactly um, what we should be doing. And, and you all deserve a lot of credit for being the ones um, to be taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today. So thank you for doing that. And uh, the work's not over. We still have a lot more work to do. We have the ability to, to make a big change here. And uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's we, we should make sure to use it. And I think now um, I'm going to be passing it along to the Harris Waltz campaign deputy director of Jewish outreach, Hillary Brandenburg. Hillary, with only seven days left here, how can Jewish voters take action with the campaign? Great question. And it's actually six days left. So great days, to be yes. here with all of you. I'm Hillary Brandenburg, Jewish Outreach Deputy Director for the Harris Wells Campaign. Thank you to JDCA, Jewish Women for Kamala, and the many partners and special guests who spoke to us today. With six days until post polls close, we need every person on this call to help get out the vote for Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Walls. As the Vice President said to us yesterday in her closing argument, we have the power to turn the page and start writing the next chapter in the most extraordinary story ever told. It starts with us. We know many of you have already voted or plan to vote before November 5th. Whether you vote early, absentee, or on November 5th, confirm your plan to vote and check IWillVote.com to make sure you know where to show up and what's on your ballot. Reach out to everyone in your own network and ask how they plan to cast their ballot. Commit to one more action to get out the vote than you had planned. Go to go.kamalaharris.com slash Jewish voters for specific opportunities for our Jewish community or go.kamalaharris.com to search all GOTV opportunities by zip code. Sign up to make calls to voters at any time that works best for you. Knock doors in a battleground state or commit to support voter protection efforts. 
We'll follow up by email with specifics on how you can get involved. From all of us on the Harris Walls campaign, thank you for all that you're doing. We hope to see you getting out the vote over the next six days. And with that, I'll hand it back to Bobby. Thanks, Hillary. And thanks to everyone who has joined us today, our speakers, all of you joining from home, and to the thousands of you who have joined us over what seems to be, uh, I don't even know what, years of an election cycle that we have six days left to finish strong. I'm Bobby Saperstein. I'm JDCA's Chief Program Officer. And again, what an inspiring evening. We've laughed, we've quetched, we've celebrated our progress and achievements, and we've reflected on what more must be done in these next six days. But most importantly, as we've heard tonight, we didn't come just to schmooze and have a good time. We've come to take action. As everyone has said and repeated, this election is so close. Every poll is within the margin of effort, and now is the time to put in the work and get it done. With your help, JDCA has already accomplished more than 2 million direct voter contacts, knocking doors, making calls, canvassing, mobilizing your communities, friends, neighbors, synagogues across the country, and together we're making a difference in key races and at every level in swing states this cycle. But we do need your help to finish crossing the finish line. Please visit jewishdems.org backslash last call to sign up for a shift to knock on those doors and make those calls into swing states, including one that's going on right now after this program. And while you're on our website, definitely check out our store for the best Election Day Harris Walls merch. It's available for a limited time and you don't want to miss that window. You know, here at JDCA, we talk a lot about values, Jewish values, democratic values. The great sages of our tradition teach that it's not enough to simply hold these values. We actually have to implement them. And the way that we do so here in the United States is by voting. So as we embark upon these final six days, let's make sure we leave it all on the field and do everything we can to get out the vote and elect Kamala Harris as our next president, Tim Walls as our next vice president, and Democrats up and down the ballot who share our Jewish and democratic values. Our collective future depends on it. So thank you for joining us. Wishing each of you strength and resolve in these final days. Chazak via And now let's get out there and win. Good night, everyone.